Welcome to this fifth episode of part second of NYU Artificial Intelligence course, uh, 11 a.m. New York City live. Where did we left off? What are we talking about, right? So we start talking about classification machine learning. That was a few lessons ago. Uh, we saw that we could have done classification with a probabilistic model, uh, namely Naive Bayes, which allows us to come up with a joint distribution by multiplying all those probabilities that are conditionally independent. Then we moved towards another architecture, which was this for now, non-probabilistic approach, right? Which is this perception. Uh, this perception is the first grandparent, how do you call it? First uh, relative to neural networks we're gonna be covering soon uh, for deep learning, right? Uh, so this is like the, the thing that started. I also pointed out the, the original article. I haven't read it, I should check it out. But anyway, that that was the first mechanism, right? We, we learned that there was like a updating rule. Actually, I forgot. So let's actually review what we have seen last time, right? Uh, such that we can be all on the same page. Also, there is a homework assignment on the perception, right? So by doing the assignment, you can uh, better understand the concept. So again, once more, these are slides I borrow from Peter Abil. I've been heavily modifying them because of the notation is not matching my notation. But again, it's mostly uh, his, his slides. So we said this perceptron is like a first rough approximation on how these neurons in the brain work. They are called uh, all or non response. They are either firing or not firing. And so again, we had something similar in this case. We have some input features that are extracted from our data point. For example, we saw for emails, we can consider like the, the presence of each of the words how many misspells, like misspellings we have, how many times we can count the word free, uh, whether my name is mentioned and so on. So we have to uh, engineer some features out of the data point X. And then these features are what we feed to the perception inputs, right? And then the, in this specific case, the prediction, my Y tilde, and the tilde means an approximation. My prediction is either this is a spam or not. In the other case, we saw there was a digit, uh, like a two in this case, and the features were, for example, the pixels, whether they are on or off, so they are like binary features, or perhaps we can have the counts of the number of loops, all those kind of things, right? And then again, given these features, our perception was figuring out how to construct a weight vector. What is this weight vector doing? Let me repeat, we have these feature vectors. For every input, we have a vector. Each singular feature has a specific weight, okay? And then the sum of the multiplication between the features and the weight is gonna call the activation, right? So that was the perceptron activation. Sum of all weighted features, right? A weighted sum, okay. So if the weighted sum is positive, then output plus one first class. If the inner product, this summation is negative, then output negative one. And so again, we have a bunch of features that are multiplied by their corresponding weights. Here, again, the thickness of the arrow represents the weight, right? How, how much importance you want to put on the specific feature, right? It can be also negative weights, right? We don't have restrictions on the weight. So weights are not necessarily like positive weight. You can also be the other way around. So we multiply each feature by a weight, then we sum them up. We get a specific value, right? This activation, is it larger than zero? Yes, then output plus one. Is it lower than zero? Then output minus one. All right, we, we saw that. And so we figure out that basically this perceptron comes up with basically a decision rule, right? This kind of boundary that was the hyperplane uh, defined by the uh, weight vector. The weight vector, you know, the orthogonal thing is this kind of boundary, which is allowing me to separate linearly separable classes. How are we updating these weights? So we start with an initial set of weights. So I'm just re recapping, right? I'm not talking about anything new. That's why I'm going to be, I'm kind of fast. So we are starting with weights equals zero. Then we were picking up a, a training point. This basically uh, X and Y. We extract the features outside the X. And then we were classify the current data point with our weights. So where is my new point falling? It falls on the, the left side or the right side. So let's say it falls on the correct side. So cool do nothing, right? So if it's the prediction of my perception is correct, don't change anything. If the prediction is wrong, 
then update the weight vector such that the decision boundary will be moved to include possibly that sample, right? I'll show you uh, how this works with these vectors. In this case, we had, if this is correct, no changes. If it is incorrect, we can update the weight vector such that in this case, it goes away from the F. In this case, uh, F was going to be the uh, negative sample such that the new weight is further away. In this case, we have a negative inner product, therefore it's sent to the other class, okay? And that's where we basically left off. I showed this animation that in a few steps, we basically update the weight vector until it finds a location that is able to separate the two points, okay? Questions, this is recap, okay? Question on this, all good? You can hear, yes, everyone is all right. Yes, okay, all right, moving forward. Today's lesson. So moving on, on today's lesson, uh, it's actually a extension of the perception algorithm to a multi-class uh, type, okay? So, so far we saw how we can classify spam versus ham, but we don't necessarily know how to do digit recognition because there are multiple classes. So how can I create a classifier that is able to classify more than two classes? That, that's how we figure out today. Well, the first part of today's lesson. So we're going to have now a weight vector, W, for each class. Let's say we have three classes. Therefore, Y can be one, two, or three. Sweet. So in this case, I had W1, W2, W3. OK, good. That's what I said. Now we're going to be computing a score or activation, or whatever you want to call it, for each class Y. Therefore, I will have. Uh, for each, you know, y equal one, two, or three, I will have this w1 inner product with the feature vector, w2 inner product with the feature vector, w3 inner product with the feature vector. Therefore, I have three scores that are representing the projection of my feature towards each of the three uh, weights. Okay, projection, right, is the same thing in in geometry. Inner product is called projections. Like how much two vectors? project on, onto, onto each other, right? We, we know this thing. We know, yes, no. Do we know about projections, inner product projection? Okay, yes, I guess we do. Very good. All right, so now my prediction, which is no longer called Y tilde, now it's kind of, maybe you already seen these symbols before. My prediction is called Y hat. Why is called Y hat? Because Y hat is the arg maximizer of all these inner products, okay? So I have how many inner products here? Three, because I have three weights. Y hat is the index of the largest inner product. And the hat, again, pointing upwards, means it's a maximizer. And I hope it makes sense. So in this case, you have that in the yellow region, W1, inner product with F has the largest projection. In the blue space, you have the W2 inner product has the largest score or activation. In the pink red region, similarly, W3 is the weight that has the largest inner product with a point over there. Okay? And so basically, we have a like a split now, like a multiple decision boundaries, which allow us to separate now three classes, for example, okay? All right. Let's see now how we learn these weights, okay? How did we learn the weight before? Before we were checking, our prediction is correct, do nothing. Our prediction is wrong before, right? And then we were updating the weight based on the fact that either should come close to my feature vector or go far away based on the fact that you are misclassifying a positive class or a negative class, right? Instead, in the, in the multi-class version, it works very similar, but we had to generalize this concept to multiple classes. So binary, it's the same as multi-class where the negative class have weight zero, right? Which binary would be basically you only have one, one weight. All right, so let's see how we do learning for the multi-class perceptron. So we start again with this weight uh, equals zero, why weight is bold. We already mentioned this. Tell me in the chat, why is weight bold here in the slide? What does bold mean? Vector, good. All right, 
So you, you, you get used to my notation. Good. So we pick up a training sample, uh, X and Y, and therefore I had this uh, feature vector F on top of X. So we pick them up one by one. Now we predict which is my, my winning uh, class. Okay. So I have this argmax. I try all possible uh, Ys here, all possible different uh, Y primes, actually. I call this Y prime in order not to confuse ourselves with the target. Okay. So the, the data is called X and Y. And here in the running index, it's called Y prime. This Y prime is different, right? In PyTorch, don't the weight start with random values rather than zero? That is correct because in a PyTorch, well, usually we will use PyTorch for training neural networks, which have multiple uh, layers. For one layer, it's not necessary. You need to have different values than zero for multi-layer uh, neural net because you need to break symmetry. Uh, otherwise, the model will learn the exact single <laughs> approximation. Okay. In our case, there is only one uh, layer. This is not necessary. But we could have started with an arbitrary position. But in a neural net, we actually need to uh, break the symmetries. Anyway, talking about that in the next lesson. Don't worry. So here we compute our y hat, which is the wider hat. Remind me the hat. Hat. What does it mean? Hat. The, the arg max, right? Okay. So hat tells us the arg, arg max. Yeah. Arg, y hat is the index of the maximum uh, inner product. There you go. Okay. Sweet. So in this case, I have that my F is going to be the, the feature. My W y hat, which is the weight that has the uh, largest inner product. In this case, is the same as the uh, weight for the correct class. Okay, so let's say I have two classes. In this case, my y hat, my my prediction is the same as the target. So in this case, if it's correct, no change, right? Let's say we uh, it is not the case. Let's say my y hat actually is this one, but y hat in this case is different from the uh, wy, right? Which is the weight associated to the correct class. So in this case, if I made a mistake, then I have to lower the score for the wrong answer. And then I have to rise the score of the right answer. Okay. So this one becomes the wrong. This is the wrong uh, answer because this is the correct one. They are different. Therefore, if this is correct, this is wrong. I have to lower the inner product that I had to lower the score for this class. How do I do that? The same way we, we, we've done in the, in the previous slide, we subtract the feature F from my weight. Okay. So if I subtract, this means I assign the, the new value for the W Y hat is going to be assigned the previous one minus the feature. So if I do that, I move my W Y hat here. So I will I have lower the inner product. And then I have to rise the score for the correct answer. This is the correct answer. I have to rise the score. How do I do that? I just sum F over here. Okay. So I will sum to my WY the feature such that now I have this longer vector more oriented towards the feature such that now this uh, possibly situation has reversed, right? So this one has a lower inner product than this one. In this case, actually, the new y hat would be the same as the uh, wy okay do we understand okay just complain if you don't understand right all right so let, let's actually have a, a practical example just to make sure we are on the same page so here i have three sentences win the vote win the election win the game and then i have three possible classes i have the class for sport i have the class for politics and then I have the class for tech. I initialize, in this case, these uh, three weights. Uh, not all of them uh, at zero. Actually, I initialize the sport one with bias one. Otherwise, you know, I cannot make it work on this small example, but it, you don't have to, okay? I'm just making this for sake of uh, animation clicking on, on PowerPoint, <laughs> okay? All right, so first, what do we need? Tell me in the chat. What, what do I need to start this uh, learning of the, this specific perception? So I have my weights. I have my axis. Arguably, okay, very good, f of x. 
So what is going to be f of x in this case? For example, for the first sentence. Okay, stop typing f of x. I understand you, you, you can copy the previous answer. <laughs> answer this question. What is the uh, f of x for the first statement, right? For the first sentence. Maybe you want to ask me a question back, right? The Euclidean distance from each class vector, no. Uh, that would be the um, almost the, the score. No, 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 no. Right now we we are we as you pointed out, every, as everyone type in the chat, we have to get this feature, okay, for the x. X being the document, f of x being the list of features. You can know well. I, I, if you if you pick on the on the on the bottom side of the slide, you already know what are the weights, right? Called. And then to compute the score, we have to do the inner product, right? So the, the weights have to match, well, the feature have to match the weight, well, the other way around, right? You, the weight has to match the feature, but in this case, you can cheat, well, in the slide, and you can match the feature to the weight that you can see on the slide. Therefore, again, I repeat my question, enough with the tips for you, otherwise it's too easy to answer. What is the feature vector for the first sentence? Oh. Win one, game zero, vote one, v one. All right. So one zero one one, right? Mm, okay, almost, almost. Actually, uh, Cheng is correct. Why Cheng is correct? What 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 Edison missed? The bias, right? Okay. All right. So that's a good point, right? So the bias will also be, uh, we have to include the bias, which is gonna be set to one for every possible sample. This bias is gonna be like a static feature, equal one for every possible sample. Why is this necessary? Remember, in order to move that decision boundary uh, and not having it uh, on, like staying on the origin, right? So if you had the bias, we can actually move the decision boundary along my vector. The decision boundary otherwise is forced to live in the, in the origin, right? Okay. Even though the bias is a separate item compared to the weights, we can still include it in the vector, right? Yes, we will have to include it in the vector. So in practical terms, it's going to be the first component of the vector is going to be always set to one. Then we can reason on the reminder of the vector and think about the additional one allowing us to, to shift. The shifting disappears if you actually go in the plus one space. So depending on how you want to reason, you can always reason without the bias and then consider the bias as this particular element that allows you to do the shifting. If you actually consider the even the bias being a feature, then there is no more shifting, right? But that would be a plus one space. It's a bit more tricky to, uh, to, to, to reason that way, right? All right, so first of all, yes, you are correct. Where does it come from? Uh, the bias here, you can see the weight, right? So each of these vectors, uh, in this specific case, they have one, two, three, four, five elements, right? There are more, but for, for now, we just consider these vectors as being size five. The first term of the weight is going to be the weight that is multiplying the bias in the in the feature. Therefore, the first one corresponds is fixed. Every 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 data point will have a one as first element if the first element in the weight is the bias. Then the second element in the weight is the win weight. Do we have win? Yes. So there is a one here. Then there is a weight for game. Do I have a game in the input? No. So there is a zero here. Then I have a vote. Do I have a vote? Yes, they have a one. And then I have the last one, the. Do I have a the? Yes, therefore one. So this is my first feature vector for my first data sample x okay so the bias doesn't apply to the rule that we start with weight equals zero okay now what i will say in this case you could start all these weights equals zero okay but then i would have to click multiple too many times on the powerpoint slide by setting the first bias to one i have to click less times on my powerpoint slide okay just for avoiding me clicking too many times on the slide. Uh, then the, the, Brian, if the word the was in the quote twice, for example, 
Uh, would it still be 11011? Okay, depends on how we consider that, right? So you can consider these uh, features as the counters, how many times this word uh, appears in the specific document. So in that case, if it appears three times, you can have it three times appearing. Or if you consider this as a binary feature, whether is there this word present or not, then you would be zero one. Again, it depends on how the uh, you set up the feature extraction problem. Okay, you can try both ways, see which one works. We saw before, right, in our previous case here, it could be that you can have a count for some specific words. And therefore, I assume that all the other words are binary. Therefore, we are checking the presence or absence only. Okay. Again, either way, you, you, you can decide you're going to have a different model. It's going to be performing better or worse. I don't know. That's why you have to use a validation set and figure out which approach works better. Right. Brian, does it make sense? So it depends on implementation. Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. <laughs> Machine learning is an empirical science, meaning you, you try many, many, many things. Some of the things you try, uh, what happens is that many times we will try many things and many, well, most of them will not work. Some of them will work. The one that do work, then you actually try to figure out why did they work, right? So you kind of do the backward learning, right? So there are principal ways of thinking like i can all we give you in a, in a, my classes uh, like in machine learning deep learning classes is the proper way of reasoning about your problem uh, but i can't tell you how to exactly get the best result unless you're young the coon right <laughs> which can uh, most of the time exactly tell you how to get the best result that's actually a very cute thing like let me give you this small anecdote with Jan, you can ask him, I, I have five options. I ask him which one would, would, would it work? And he tells me number four. I try all of them, number four actually works, right? So it's like an oracle. It, it tells me in advance which what things work, what things don't work. If they don't work, it usually is because I cannot uh, code it properly. Anyway, the, it was a half a joke. The, the point is that we can give you uh, recipes. You can, I can give you multiple ways of performing a specific task which makes sense, like all of these are possible uh, good strategies, but for a specific problem, some of them will perform better. Do I know which one uh, will perform better? No. Then we have to do something that is called model selection. What is this model selection? You try multiple models. Let's say in this case, you try naive base classification and you try perception classification. You will have some validation set for iterating over multiple K Laplace, you know, the smoothing factors for that thing. You might iterate here for, I don't know what we can try to iterate in the perception. Again, some hyperparameters, maybe number or type of features you want to extract. Given that you get the best performance out of these two models on the validation set, then you can compare which model works the best on a test set. So you will use the test set to do model selection, which is figuring out what is the technique that has uh, it has a superior uh, performance on this specific task. So it is always this case. You have to try all of them, well, most of them, that makes sense, and then figure out which one works the best. So it's just for you. Yes, the clicking, right? Uh, it, it's just a, an animation on PowerPoint. <laughs> all right, let, let, let's go back to my clicking thing. <laughs> So how do we train this thing? We start with weight equals zero. In this case, I slightly changed this to make the thing easier. Then I pick up a sample. In our case, the first sample was win the vote, okay? So I have one specific win the vote, X. I have a feature, you told me what it is. What is the Y? Can you tell me what is the Y for this guy here? For win the vote? Politics, I guess it is correct, yes. Uh, so we know we know what is X, we know what is F, you computed F, uh, you, you guess correctly, James guessed correctly Y, yes. Now we have to come up with Y hat. How do I do Y hat? Y hat is going to be the index of the largest inner product. So what do I have to compute now? Well, in order to compute the largest, I have to compute the inner product, right? So for each class, Y prime, I had to compute this inner product, right? So what is the inner product between this vector and this vector?
One, yes, okay. Yeah, okay. How about the inner product with the, with, okay, between this stuff and zero, it's gonna be zero, of course, right? Everything just disappears. And similarly, uh, the inner product of this stuff with zero is gonna be zero. What is Y hat? Y hat is the first class, but which one is Y in, instead? Politics, okay, very good. Therefore, we have to change the weights. How would we have to change the weight? We need to make this inner product smaller and we have to make this inner product larger, okay? So can you type more than just one word now in order to be, okay, where do I have to put minus F? Why, okay, hold on one sec. Why, why is politics? Uh, so win the vote. What do you believe? What do you think this sentence belongs to? Okay, good. We update the weights based on our previous result. Okay, so what are the next weights for the sport class? Zero, minus one, zero, minus one, minus one. Looks correct to me. Let's try. Yes, okay. Good, Edison. Edison, you're always answering very good que the questions. How about the weight for politics? Uh, one, one, zero, one, one. Yeah. Okay. How about the weight for tech? Okay. Very good. All right. So I don't, I don't change anything here. All right. Sorry. Can you explain why? Okay. Patrizio, wh which part? Can you explain the change? Yes. Okay. So from the previous slide, we said the, the following, right? If our prediction is correct, meaning I predict a sport given that is sport, or whatever, I, I don't have to change anything, right? So in this case was, yeah, sport, right? So let's assume the, the, the sentence was pertaining sport. And I also predict, uh, so my prediction, it is sport, is the same as the uh, target. Y is again my, my target. So if I get the correct prediction, don't do anything, right? So if you, you got it correct, don't change anything. Uh, otherwise, if you didn't get it correct, right? So in this case, I say, so this is the weight for sport, which is has a larger inner product with F. There is a larger projection of F towards the sport class than the projection towards the uh, politics. Then, since it's wrong, I would like to uh, lower the score, the, the projection for the incorrect class and increase the projection for the correct class. So far, that do you make, does it make sense? OK, so we have to reduce the, the projection for this guy, increase the projection for this one. How do I do that? I subtract my feature from this weight such that now the inner product is smaller. And then I sum the feature to this weight such that now the inner product is larger. You, you OK? You understand? OK. So in this case, I've subtracted my feature. <laughs> I subtracted my feature from this uh, weight, weight vector such that I lower the inner product. If you compute now uh, the inner product of this stuff and this thing, what does it come out? You have zero minus one, zero minus one minus three, right? If I, if I did that correct. So now if with this specific weight, the score would be minus three. And for this score would be two, four, right? Minus three, four, zero. So with this correct uh, current weights, uh, updated weights, the first statement would be correctly classified as belonging to politics uh, because it's plus four, minus three, zero. So we always change the bias if we need to change any field for a vector. So the bias is just the first feature uh, of my, it's my first feature. And in the weight is just one weight. Okay. It's the weight that is weighting the bias. It's as you just deal with this as part of the weight, right? You don't treat it differently. Okay. Joshin. Oh. So W tech is like the W prime in the previous slide. 
It's not changed because it's not relevant. That is exactly correct, Lisa. Yeah, good. All right. The new score for the correct answer will be F square larger than yeah. So if you compute this, Edison, right? If you do inner product of this thing and this weight, you get minus three, all right? And inner product of this thing and this thing is going to be four. Inner product of this thing and this thing is still zero. So now it is correctly classified. So we just rotated this, basically the, 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 the two vectors, right? We send sport vector away and then we send a uh, politics vector close to the F. The new score for the Korea. Uh, Okay, I answer everyone. Question, what is the feature vector for the second case? One, one, zero, zero, one. There are five, five numbers though. One, okay, hold on. One, one, oh my God. Bias, one. Win, one. Game, no, zero, okay. And then we have vote. Zero and then the one. Okay, good. Yes, correct. All right. So inner product with this weight here. How much is the first inner product? First inner product minus two. Very good. Second inner product. How much is the second inner product? Three. Yes. Okay. How about last inner product? Okay, it's all zero. So again, okay, very good. Uh, therefore, who's winning here? Politics. Okay. Uh, how about the so what politics would be why hat? What do you believe to be <laughs> the poll? What, is, what do you believe the why for the second statement is? Also political, right? Okay, good. So do I have to do any change of the weights? Yes, no? No, okay, good. All right, so I don't change anything. Moving forward, what is the feature for the last X? Win the game. Win game the one, one, one. Zero one. Yes. Good. For then sport projection on sport. How much is projection on sport? One minus two. Okay. Yes. How about projection on politics? Okay. Hold on. Why the bias is always one? Because the bias is defined as the feature uh, set equal one. Okay. So the bias, hold on, if <laughs> everyone typing. Uh, the bias is the feature that is set to one, is always set to one regardless of whatever you have. And that allows us, again, to move that decision boundary up and down the uh, weight vector. Otherwise, I cannot move the decision boundary. It has to be hinged in the, in the zero, okay? But isn't that we have changed W put, okay. So there are two different uh, parts in the bias. There is a weight, for the bias, okay? So there is a weight, there's a bias term inside the weight, and that is uh, like how much the bias will weight. I can have five minus three, seven, whatever number. In the feature, that uh, term is gonna be set to one. Every time, every possible input has its own bias feature set to one, okay? So there are weight for the bias, and then there is the, uh, like the, the amount, what is the feature for the bias? Bias feature, bias weight. Th does it make sense? Okay. Why it's still minus two? You can just try to multiply a uh, tone. If you do this, this vector in a product with this vector, how much is it? Tone? Tone, are you following? Okay. All right. So politics, I guess we you already answered my question three. So, okay. And then the last one is going to be all zero because all of us are zero. So win the game, which one, what class should this sentence belong to? Well, I guess sport. Wait, what? No, 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 no. What this should belong to, right? What is the why? What is the target? Sorry, let me express myself. Yeah, this should belong to the uh, sport class because it talks about a game. But what is my prediction? My prediction is the largest. Uh, these are all zeros. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I have 
it, it says that yeah, it, it says it, it should belong to politics. Therefore, what do I have to do now? Tell me. Add F to sport, subtract from politics. Very good. So I will add this to sport becoming one, zero, one. I keep the same and a zero. I just sum right this vector to this one. So these are my new sport vector. And now I have to, we said, uh, subtract to this thing, right? So I have subtract, subtract, subtract. So minus one. I don't change. And then the last one, zero. Okay. I did what Franny told me to do. All right, moving forward. So maybe we can actually finish this deck of slides and then we start neural networks on Wednesday. Anyway, let, let, let's try to move forward. Uh, properties of perception. So let's see what is good with this perception. So separability, true if some parameters get, uh, true if some parameters get the training set perfectly correct. So meaning if the if the data points are linearly separable, therefore, like after updating this, the, 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 the weights several times, I will find eventually a separable location. Uh, in this case, the data points are non-linearly separable. You see, there is a, a minus here, there is a plus there. So in this case, data points are not linearly separable, right? So separability depends, I guess, on the uh, data set uh, you have. Convergence, if the training is separable, then perceptron, the perceptron will eventually converge okay, in the binary case. So we have a guarantee uh, over the, uh, the fact that we can actually find a solution. Mistake bound, that's actually cute. Uh, the maximum number of mistakes in the binary case is related to the margin, so meaning how much is the space between uh, the, the positive and the negative or degree of margin, yeah, or degree of separability. So we have that the number that my perceptron will make eventually uh, is gonna be lower than this number of feature over the margin square. So if the margin is the space between these things, the things here, uh, the larger the margin, right? And the larger this thing, so the lower the number of mistakes, right? The more the features and the more mistakes I can make because I have many more ways to, to update and possibly, you know, make mistakes about. Uh, problems. So noise. If the data isn't separable, weights might thrash. I didn't know this word before. <laughs> so this means that if I have, like in this case, a like a blue guy over here and a red guy over here, basically the, the perceptron will keep uh, oscillating. It's gonna be pushing, pushed back and forth between the, the, the two samples, right? Because every time we make a mistake, we update the decision boundary. But we will always make a mistake. So this decision boundary will like pop, 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 like ping pong back and forth. Uh, averaging weight vector over time can help, right? If you kind of uh, slow down the ping pong, right? If you add some mass, then you ooh, eventually we converge, but again, if you don't slow down the, the ping pong, we ping pong forever, right? All right. Uh, yeah, so ping pong, ping pong. <laughs> uh, mediocre generalization. Uh, that's, a, that's a bad one. Uh, finds a barely separating solution. So eventually, what happens if this is my decision boundary? Well, if this is my decision boundary and all data points are correctly classified, this decision boundary here on the right side will not be moved, right? Because as long as I'm making correct predictions, I don't update anything. And so even though that decision boundary is barely correct, well, it is correct. And then the perception algorithm will say, all good. Because again, it tells you either right or wrong, right? Like it tells you it's a binary decision. It doesn't care about how far you are from the decision boundary. Uh, and that can be problematic because if this is my training set and in my test set, there's gonna be a data point that is close to the boundary, it will likely get misclassified, right? So that's no good. Uh, so, you know, you almost, you can hit <laughs> your, your data point. Um, and overtraining, okay, that's actually annoying. So the, the point is that what happens is that as you keep training, iterating over the data points, 
uh, your training uh, accuracy will get better and better and better. But then at some point, also your test and held out uh, accuracy will increase. But then at some point, you will start uh, getting worse performance because you are exactly training uh, the training set, right? You are exactly learning the, this, the, the, where these points are located. And so in order to avoid overfitting, like fitting the noise in the training set, you can use something called early stopping, meaning as soon as you see the validation, the held out set lowering, then you just stop training. It means, okay, fine, we train enough. The more I train, the more I will lear learn the noise that is in present in the training set. Our, our overtraining, overfitting, right? We can just fix this by uh, early stopping. I, I don't understand <laughs> the, the, the drawing here. Okay. So improve the perception. This is actually very interesting. How do we improve this uh, algorithm to you know, uh, ameliorate some of these uh, bad performance that we observe? So in this case, uh, when we have non-separable cases, we, we always make mistakes, okay? So even the best the linear decision boundary makes at least one mistake, right? And in this case also, it's gonna be flipping back and forth. How about uh, using a slightly different approach, right? So if we cannot say for certainty uh, which class each of these points belongs, then how about we come up with this again, again, degree of belief, right? And so in this case, my decision boundary is the point where I assign the probability of a point belonging to one class or the other as being 0.5. And now I can make like parallel uh, lines. And here I say that the points at this location, it's 70% blue, 30% red. And the other case, you know, the symmetric way, this is 70% red, 30% blue. So in this case, it's not necessarily like, it's very unlikely that a point is red, but it's not impossible. Therefore, point one, it's you know better than saying it is impossible. It's not impossible, it's very unlikely. And similarly on the other side, okay? So let's switch instead of using this binary decision to a actually degree of belief, right? Remember degree of belief, probability, second lesson with me. <laughs> All right. The perception scoring, let's call this inner product just S, S for score or linear linear score, whatever, S such that I don't have to type all those symbols, right? It's gonna be just easier. Again, S, why S is a lowercase non-bold thing? Makes this a scalar, very good. Okay, you're following, good, good, good. Uh, it's not true for X, X is something I say, X, X is a document, but it doesn't matter, right? Okay. Uh, all right, so if S is very positive, right? So if you're very, very good aligned with that, uh, if you, the, your projection is very positive, then maybe I, I, would, I would like to have a probability that is just one, right? Almost one. Uh, instead, if S is very negative, then I would like to have a probability that goes to very zero. So S, again, it's a real number that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, and I'd like to map the real numbers to something that goes from zero to one, right? Let's introduce therefore the sigmoid function. The sigmoid function, sigma, has this specific expression, one over one plus e to the minus beta s. Uh, in this case, again, every time you see a beta, uh, beta is the coldness coefficient. If I don't specify, let, let's just forget about it and let's set it to one, okay? It's going to turn out to be very convenient to have this beta uh, in later slides or even like in the assignment. But again, for the now, for the moment, we can we can ignore it. So how does it work? So if you uh, plot it with matplotlib, you're going to get something like that. Uh, around uh, whenever the argument here is roughly uh, minus five, kind of this uh, sigmoid is basically zero, okay? So everything that is lower than negative five, it's flat zero. And everything that is larger than basically plus five, right, over here, it's basically one, okay? On the other case, when the argument S is going to be zero, uh, you can see one over one plus exponential of zero, well, negative zero, it's gonna be one plus one, two, one over two, one half, right? So this thing is equal to one half when I hit the, the zero in the S, 
it hits basically plus one at plus five, it hits zero at minus five, right, more or less. And then everything is just flat here, flat here. So now let's say these are my data points. In this case, X is actually a scalar, and that's why I have uh, represented here as a single uh, arrow, okay? So my, my feature is single feature equal X. So these points are definitely red. So I can see, right, all of these are red. On the other side, I have definitely blue points. And then in the middle is some sort of like mixture of red and blue, right? So maybe I'm not sure what this should be classified with. So let's say I, I, I assign to this point the probability uh, of being blue equal the probability of being red equal 0.5. I don't know. Could be one or the other. Now I can actually introduce this probability P of being red in this specific case, given that I observe my X, which should possibly say uh, zero here, right? These points are very unlikely uh, red, so very likely blue. And this one basically goes to one to this side where I pretty much sure these points are red, okay? And so how do we, where do we get this from? Well, this is the, the expression I showed you before. So I have this probability of being red, given my, my observed X, is gonna be the sigmoid of the inner product, right, this score. So in our case, we only have a single feature equal the X itself. So I have a weight scaling my X. What, what is this thing here? Bias, okay, very good, yeah, yeah, yeah. And why is that? Because it's gonna be multiplied by the feature number one, equal one, right? That basically I only have W, W0 here. Okay. So these are almost one, almost zero, okay. Remember I told you there was a beta. Beta was the coldness. So if I have beta equal one, you have the same curve as I show you here. Now, if I increase the beta, since it's cooler, I will draw it with a darker color. And so this one is gonna be my, uh, my, my sigmoid with a beta equal five, right? So basically what it made, uh, it made more steep, right? This, this thing. So if this uh, other curve was much slower, smoother, this is like much steeper one. And then if I crank up the coldness, I freeze it, I'm gonna be getting something that looks like the uh, perception uh, output, right? Zero or one or well, the perceptual out output was negative one plus one, right? In this case, I output zero or one, corresponding to the negative one plus one of the perceptron. And this thing we're gonna be seeing uh, later, it looks like a arc max. Again, we don't really care right now too much. All right, so which are the best weights? How do we learn the weights such that uh, we make this the whole thing work, right? So what are the best weights for this new updated perceptron, which has this probabilistic uh, output, right? No more this uh, binary thing. So remember, we are in the, in the uh, naive Bayes class, we were talking about this maximum likelihood estimate. What is the maximum likelihood? Well, in the other case, in the naive Bayes, we were, we stated that the likelihood is a function of the parameters theta in that case. And it tells us what is the probability that the data set is generated by the specific uh, weight, right? Uh, in this case, it's a bit, it's a bit different. We have that this uh, likelihood is going to be the probability that the Y appears given a specific X. So we have a conditional probability in this case. Again, this probability being parameterized by my weight, okay? So in the other case, we had the joint X and Y. In this case, we have just the Y given X. So this is an example of, it's called discriminative model, whereas the other one, the naive base is called a generative model. The major difference between what we saw in the last lesson was that we were trying to maximize the joint probability in the other class, in the naive base, where we had the probability of X and Y. Whereas in this case, we are just learning how to maximize the conditional probability directly, y given x. Anyway, just terminology. So we said the w hat, which is the arg maximizer of this uh, likelihood, 
is going to be the same as are maximizing the log likelihood. I can flip the product and the and the with the log that becomes a summation, right? And we have this summation of the log probabilities. So what is this probability? Well, this probability is the one we just defined. So for the case where we have the correct class, it's going to be the sigmoid of the uh, inner product. And for the wrong class, well, the, the negative class, we have one minus the sigmoid of the inner product, okay? How do we do this arc maximization? We see that in a future lesson. So what happens now? By using this probability, uh, by finding the weights that are maximizing the probability of a given label for the specific X, something will happen. Well, two things actually happen. So this is also called logistic regression, right? So this probabilistic uh, extension of the perception algorithm uh, takes the name of logistic regression. What is the major difference between these two cases? So if you can see here, by maximizing the probability of these points, they all, all of these will get 0.7. Whereas this guy here gets 0.5, this guy gets 0.7, and this guy gets maybe 0.9. So if you would like to maximize the probability of all these guys, then the decision boundary will actually be aligned, well, will be in this direction, such that all of this guy will have 0.7. Rather than having a decision boundary that is almost barely, well, separating, they are separating, but this guy will get 0.5, this guy will get 0.5. Whereas with the maximum likelihood solution, we're going to get the, all these three points will get 0.7, all these three points will get also 0.7 for the other class. And so we actually get a better now general, uh, generalization because the separation is actually nicely uh, placed such that it has it gives the highest probability to my class label. Okay. All right. So let's see how we can extend the multi class, the one we started uh, the lesson with today, uh, with this probabilistic uh, view. Okay. So recall from before, we had a weight for each class. Then we were computing an inner product for each of these possible classes, right? And then we were figuring out which one is the class with the largest uh, value. And then we are figuring out, you know, which one it should belong to. So how do we convert these scores into probabilities, right? We saw that we, if it was binary, we can use the sigmoid, right? The sigmoid was mapping the real number from negative infinity to plus infinity to something that goes from zero to one. How do we map now a arbitrary number of scores into a probability distribution? Well, we use this kind of uh, expression. So these numbers are going from negative infinity to plus infinity. These are the inner products, right? Now, I'd like to, the probability need to be a positive number. So I will exponentiate each of them such that they become, uh, you know, positive numbers. And then I have to sum, the, the, I have that the sum of the three things will have to be equal to one. So I divide each of these terms by the sum of the three exponentials. So these are the original linear activations, and these are my soft argmax activations, okay? I will go through this nomenclature again in the pro next lesson, but again, most of the time outside this class, you will see uh, this arg missing from this word, which is a mistake. We'll learn about this again in the next lesson, don't worry. Anyway, so we switch between uh, real numbers to zero to one numbers, okay? This also is called the uh, probabilistic simplex again. Okay? That doesn't matter. So finally, how do we learn all these weights uh, for each of the classes? Same thing as before. So now, exactly as I just copy and paste the previous slide, I had uh, the uh, W hat, which is my uh, arg maximizer of, of the likelihood. Is again, the arg maximizer of the log likelihood, because again, it doesn't matter if you have arg max of the, of the log. I flip the product with the uh, log such that this becomes a summation. And then I sum all of these items. Now there is a difference between the previous slide. Before this was coming out from my sigmoid. Now this comes out from my 
ratio of the exponentiated score for the specific class divided by the sum of all the scores. Now, if you want to make it uh, a cute exercise, if you have two classes only, this expression basically simplifies, reverts to the uh, sigmoid. I, I, you can try it. Uh, I think it's nice. Okay. So in the case where you only have two classes, you can divide the numerator by and the denominator, denominator by the uh, numerator. You're going to get one minus, and then you have one plus the exponential of the minus something, right? So you, you, you're you going to see that uh, this thing basically reverts the previous slide. Okay. So once again, beta uh, is the coldness coefficient allows me to chill the, the system. If I don't specify, it's going to be equal to one. And the specific model, it's called multi-class logistic regression. Questions? I, I know it's, 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 it's a bit. But basically, we what 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 I what we've been doing right now was the fact that we observed that we had some issues with this perception. Okay, so perception perception has some good qualities. If the data is separable, then we can actually find the uh, decision boundary, so it does converge, and the number of mistakes is bounded. But then we saw that we have a problem of of jumping around and have. Uh, mediocre generalization. So this jumping around, and th this was a, this was a problem. Therefore, we uh, introduced this probabilistic view, where instead of saying right and wrong, we assign a probability to data points, and then we saw this uh, how this works for the binary class, binary case where we use this sigmoid that allows me to map this score. Uh, that is a real number from negative infinity to plus infinity to a number that goes from zero to one that you can see over here. Okay, in, in this case, okay, how do we learn these weights? We said we, we learn this weight by maximizing the uh, log likelihood, which is again finding the weights that are giving me the largest probability, well, the largest log probability to the uh, to the label, and therefore this case here gets actually corrected in this case, which assigns larger probability to the correct classes. Finally, we extended uh, not just the binary case, but also the multi-class case using this uh, expression here. We had multiple inner products, multiple scores. And so these scores are mapped from real numbers from negative infinity to plus infinity to a triple in this case, since I have only three classes. Uh, the triple sum to one, right? Because you can see exponential like e to the s1 plus e to the s2 plus e to the s3 divided by the sum is going to be equal to one. And they are positive because the exponential uh, is a positive function, right? And so this way allowed me to uh, convert my multi-class perceptron into a multi-class logistic regression. How do we find these weights? Again, by arc maximizing the log likelihood. What are these probabilities? This is going to be this uh, coming from this soft arc max. Questions? I know it's one minute before the end. All good? OK, so in the next lesson, we're going to be figuring out how to actually get these weights. In the previous case, we were trying, we subtract and sum. In this case, it's a bit harder and trickier. So next lesson, we're going to figure out how to use a computer to find out these weights, which is this learning uh, mechanism. Thank you so much. Enjoy the eclipse. I'm going to put the slides and the recording uh, as soon as they are ready. Uh, deadline again for programming assignment three, it's uh, this uh, Wednesday. Sorry, we, we uh, added two more days. And that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for being with me. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.